how many years has it been since I saw you down at Franklin? At least two, yeah. Let's open our Bibles to Luke chapter 22. I'll be reading from the New, English, uh, New uh, King James Version, and I'll be reading verses 31 and 32. Luke 22, verses 31 and 32. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you, that he might sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, that your faith should not fail, and that when you return to me, strengthen your brothers. May the Lord add his blessing as Dan Batchelder brings us the word this morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. This is a beautiful day. I mean, it's a little overcast right now, but it's, it is a gorgeous day out. I was told a few weeks ago I presented this study at down in Haverhill, Haverhill, Massachusetts church. And I was told that I got the award for the shortest sermon title. <laughs> if. You know, that word, if, it's a little word with a big meaning. And it's, Take it from Matthew chapter 4. And we're going to start with verse 1 in Matthew chapter 4. It says, And Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterwards he was hungry. Anyone here ever fast for 40 days and 40 nights? How about 40 hours? Yeah, after 40 hours, you feel hungry. There's some days that after 40 minutes, I'm hungry. But, you know, 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus fasted, and he was hungry. That would be an understatement. Do you think he was physically weak? You know, be sick some day, sometime, and and not eat for a couple days, or not eat very much for a couple days, and you feel pretty weak. This is over a month. And that when he was weak, hungry. The tempter came to him and he said, If you are the Son of God, command the stones to become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on a pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He shall give, you, give his angels charge over you. And in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, All these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Notice those little words, if, in there? 
if you are the Son of God. He's trying to get Jesus to doubt who he is. Did Jesus know who he was? How did he know that? God told him. His mother told him, yes. You know, just before he went into the wilderness and fasted, if you return turn to um, Matthew chapter 3 and starting with verse 13, then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying to him, I need to be baptized you, and you're coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And he allowed, then he allowed him. You know, did Jesus need to be baptized? Did he need his sins washed away? There's something, a bigger picture here, because he says it, we need to fulfill all righteousness. Do you know that at that time, baptism was a sign of righteousness? You know? And he says, look, I'm going to perform all acts of righteousness here. I'm going to be baptized. Let's fulfill the signs of righteousness because I'm doing this as an example. That's what that verse says. And John says, okay, now I understand it. I'll, I'll baptize you. When... He had been baptized. Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus knew exactly who he was. He heard his heavenly Father speak it just before he went into the wilderness. When he was 12 years old and they're coming back from Jerusalem and they can't find Jesus and then they go back to Jerusalem and find him in the temple teaching the, teaching the, the teachers. And, his, and Mary and Joseph say to him, you know, we didn't know where you were. Where you were. And he says, didn't you know I was about my father's business? He knew who he was. But Satan, in this temptation, when he's at his weakest, is trying to get him to doubt that he is the Son of God. And he kept saying that little word, if. You know, are you really sure? You really sure that's who you are? Does the devil try to get you to doubt who you are? Who are you? Jesus knew who he was. Do you know who you are? Let's go to Let's go to Galatians chapter 4. I'm going to start with verse 1 and we're going through verse to verse 7. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is the master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Even so we, when, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, 
God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth his spirit uh, of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So who are you? You're a son of God or daughter of God through Jesus Christ. Do you think that the devil is taken and trying to get us to doubt that? <laughs> On a daily basis. And he uses people around you to doubt that. A Christian does that. You're not a Christian. If you were really a Christian, you'd be doing this. You're so bad that God can't forgive you. You know, there was a time that I studied this one thing out, and it was in a time in my life that was, put it this way, I can relate to Peter on a lot of, it, a lot of things, being very um, spontaneous. I don't know how he cut the ear of, of Malchus off. I thought he was sw swinging the sword the wrong way. I would have been swinging down. I would have been swinging this way. But I understand Peter. And, you know, Peter denied Christ three times. And God, Jesus warned Peter that this was going to happen, that he was going to deny him. Before that, he said, Peter, or Simon, Simon, you know, the devil wants you. He wants to sift you as wheat. And he tells, tells Simon that he's going to leave Jesus for a while. And he says, but when you return, strengthen the brethren. So, understand that this might be a little emotional for me. But a number of years ago, this is talking as a very protective father and love, love of a child. Um, my daughter took off when she was late teens. She took off with this guy, and he kept us. He kept her away from us for quite some time. Well, that doesn't go over real, real well with a protective father. And there was one day that. I was cutting brush out around our orchard. We were going to plant some other trees in a, in a new area. And Kathy came out and said, Dan, supper's ready. And I said, I'm not hungry. She says, you got to eat. And I mean, I'm angry. I'm just fuming over this whole thing. And she says, you got to eat. And I says, nope, I'm not hungry. I'm not eating. And her parents had just shown up. And I said to her, what I do want you to do is I want you to go into the house. I said, I want you to take my guns and give them to your father. Because I'm going hunting. And I told her what exactly I was going to do with those guns. And she 
went in and gave my guns to, to her father. I was going to kill the guy. And for a year after that, I was still trying to figure out how I was going to do it because the guns weren't in the house. And it just my life was miserable. I was angry. I was frustrated. Um, and there was this guy that was going to different church, the different church, some of the different churches. Um, brain cramp on his last name. Oh, Tom Merrill was his name. And he was a call porter, and he worked with Dennis Smith on the Holy Spirit Project thing that was going on then. And he had gone through a similar situation. He and I got talking. He goes, Dan, you need this book. And he happened to have a copy of it, and I bought it from him. And it was called Ancient Paths. Now, Ancient, it, it was a book on, it has two themes, identity and destiny, blessings and cursings. Now, God has, God has an identity for you and a destiny for you. The Satan has an identity for you and a destiny for you. Satan's identity for you is that you are a mistake, you are no good, you're worthless, you're so bad God can't forgive you, so you might as well just fall down and worship him and have fun time here in this life because that's it. And his destiny for you is to separate you from God for eternity. And God's identity for you is I've known you since before the foundations of the world. You're not a mistake. You are here at this time for a reason. I love you. I gave my only son as a sacrifice to save you. You are my child, and I love you. And his destiny for us is, I want to share eternity with you. The devil is a creature of cursings. He is the accuser of the brethren. He does everything he can to ruin your life. He's the cursor, the accuser, the destroyer. And God is a God of blessings. There's a wonderful term of blessings in Scripture that if you go back into Strong's Concordance, it's one of the words for blessing is Baruch. And when you go back and you keep going back into that word Baruch, it goes back to the root. The, it re, what it really means is one who enables somebody to have a pleasant journey. So it's not a passive blessing. It's an active blessing. That God is the God who allows us and encourages us and enables us to have a pleasant journey. There's going to be trials in that journey. So this little book was explaining all this stuff. And, it, you know, people, different people that have, had gone through things and similar to things that I was going through. It is a little thin paperback book. I don't know, maybe it was under 200 pages anyways. It took me three and a half months to read it. Because I could only read short parts at a time.
because it was taken and tearing everything apart of my life that needed to be torn apart, that needed to be gotten rid of. And one question that keeps coming up that says that God says, who are you? Who do, who are you? And what do I have to say about who you are? And you start asking God questions. And he brings out some pretty incredible things. You know, and I was angry. And I said, Lord, why am I so angry? You know, God is not afraid of our questions like that. You know, why is this happening? God answers those questions. And he told me I was always been angry, ever since I was a little kid. And he took me back to where I was angry and why I was angry and what it all stemmed from. You know, I'm the youngest of five kids. I've got older brothers that were, especially one that was pretty brutal, you know, growing up, you know, and there was anger about that sort of stuff. And, um, and he took me back to those things, back to when I was like three and four years old. And, you know, it was interesting that he brought me to those things the night before a family reunion. And he says, you need to forgive him. I says, I have to go up and tell him I forgive him? He goes, no, but you have to forgive him in your heart. He says, they don't even know that those words bothered you that affected you. You know, I got there and I heard some of the same words that I heard since I was a little kid. You know, and not only to me, but to like my nieces and nephews and stuff like that. And I'm like, you know, hearing these words and, and the Lord's going, forgive them, forgive them. Forgive them like I forgave on the cross, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. So, you know, I had gone and talked to a friend of mine who is a, who is a pastor who did counseling also when this first started. And he knew my anger and stuff. And, and then three, then a year, year and a half later, I saw him again. And I told him about the little book that I'd been reading. And I said, three and a half months. And I told him the, the journey. And he says, you know, the 12-step programs, he says, there's a group in there that does that same thing, that they go back and find out why these things are happening. And he says, it takes three and a half years to do it. And he says, how long did it take you? I says, three and a half months. And he says, God's working on you. To do it that fast. And he says, okay, so now you've gone through this. What are you going to do with it? Now what are you going to do with it? <clears throat> and I said, you know, I've been asking God that same question. You know, and he says, I said, and God said, share it with others. Because others are going through things similar. You know, I don't know if anyone here is going through any really weird situation right now that's, you know. But, you know, the devil is trying to sift us all. And, you know, that's why I said I understand Peter. 
because of going through that situation where he said, you know what? Jesus told him, he says, you know, the devil wants, Satan wants to sift you like wheat. But when you return to me, strengthen the brethren. You know, during that time, you know, I still believed, but I was having such a struggle in my life that I just didn't know what to do. And I'm glad that God did not leave me. That in spite of my anger, my foolishness, he had something bigger and better. You know, I just, I love the part in, um, in John, John chapter 21. You know, there's a breakfast going on. Jesus had put on a, a, a breakfast banquet for them. In verse 15, it says, So when they, had eat, when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said, Feed my lambs. And he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Tend my sheep. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. You know, when we go through those trials, when we go through those life-changing things that, you know, God's working on us. And then we, when we've kind of walked away and then, you know, God's still working on our hearts and just trying to draw us back into a better relationship than we had before. He says, now you've gone through these things, you understand what the other people are going through. Have that compassion. You know, he started off by saying, feed my lambs. What are lambs? They're the young, helpless ones. They're the ones that need extra special, tender care. And they need to be fed. You know, when, when we have a, la a, a lamb that, a, that the mother has rejected, we have to bottle feed that baby. We call them bummer babies. But, you know, you have to feed them. You have to take special care of those lambs to feed them. And so the first thing he says, reach out to the ones that are the most vulnerable. Take care of them. Help them. They're the ones that need you the most. And then the second time he says, tend my sheep. Make sure everyone's taken care of. Make sure they're safe. Take care of them. And the third time he says, feed my sheep. Feed them. Give them the spiritual food that they need. Peter was restored. 
He denied his Lord three times and he confessed three times. Yes, I love you. And Jesus says, help others then to know of that love. Take care of them. Feed them. Tend them. Make sure you take care of the, the weak, the vulnerable ones. The ones that need special care. You know, we've all gone through trials. We've all have things that we can show others about how God is taking care of us. One other story. Kathy and I built a house in Northwood, New Hampshire. I was working at a very lucrative job at the time. The recession hit, and money kind of dried up a lot. We were doing very well, and then all of a sudden, you know, um, where's the money going to come for groceries this week? And we were this close to losing our house. And the Lord, I'll tell you about how the Lord worked everything out. But it, the house was, a, was an earth burned house. It's a hard house to sell. It was, in the middle of, it was in the middle of a recession. I talked to a guy that I knew who was a realtor. And he says, Dan, I'm not showing any houses right now. You know, I'll, we'll list it. He says, but your house is really difficult to sell. You know, it's not one of these ones that everyone's just going to jump at. And he said, so, you know, don't expect anything. Well, in 30 days, we had a purchase and sales and a backup contract. But before it got to that point, it's that other thing of, you know, asking God questions. And... I was out at the barn one night, and I'm asking God, why is this happening? Why is it happening? You know, sometimes you don't want to hear those answers. But he took me to a verse. He gave me a verse, and I had to go in the, in the house and look up the verse. He told me, Jeremiah 22, verse 21. And the verse says, I spoke to you in your prosperity, but you said, I will not hear. It's been the manner from your youth. You did not obey my voice. It was 100% accurate. That verse was 100% accurate of me. But, you know, it took that learning experience to take and go, you know, from doing really, really well to wondering where our next meal was going to be. And I remember one day going out to the, going out to the um, mailbox, and there was an a envelope addressed to Kathy and I, no return address. Opened up and there was a $20 bill in it. We needed $20. God worked things out. You know? And then... Fast forward a couple of years, we're in Concord Church, and before, they, before the sanctuary was finished upstairs, we were meeting downstairs, and there was a guy, the, a phone call came, comes in, I'm sitting next to the phone, just, you know, happened to be sitting there. I was there for a reason. And a guy was going to commit suicide because he was losing his house.
I was the one that had gone through this. And I could speak to him about the love of God and what God did to help us. So when we go through these experiences, I don't know what experiences you've gone through, but use those experiences to help others that are going through those experiences. It's like what Jesus said to Peter, when you return, strengthen the brethren. Feed my lambs. Tend my sheep. Feed my sheep. God wants us to use those experiences to further his kingdom. So, like I said, I don't know what experiences you're going through now, but think of it that surrender to God, he'll bring you through those experiences, maybe not the way you think they were, or what you, th what you, what you think should happen, because what you think and what God thinks could be two totally different things. And, you know, use those experiences to help others. A final note on the thing about the guns being taken away and stuff. Our family likes to target practice and stuff. And number of years later we were on Thanksgiving we were target practicing and you know who I was standing right next to target practicing <laughs> the one that I was and I came down and I said to Kathy I says you'd be proud of me <laughs> I says I had loaded guns and no one got hurt <laughs> so you know, how God can take and change your heart is pretty incredible. And sometimes it's a, it's a painful, difficult process. But if we let him do it, it comes out so much better than what you ever thought it could possibly be. Our closing song today is... Number 104, my shepherd will supply my need.
Our benediction this morning is this afternoon is taken from Romans 15:13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>